uh, new series are famous in this regard, but so is Chomsky's propaganda model. Such discourses are eagerly reproduced by activists condemning the evil media and seeing them as part of the problem rather than the solution. This led to an increase in so-called movement media, independent of the non-commercial and focusing on self-mediation, building collective identities and focusing on the independent dissemination of movement frames, bypassing the editorial control of the mainstream media. Now, while the strategy of developing alternatives was to some extent successful, certainly when it came to a politics of recognition, with reference to lifestyle politics, it has also become apparent that in our hyper-mediated societies, this is arguably not enough. Despite the marked increase in opportunities for self-mediation in recent years, thanks to innovative and often subversive usages of the internet, the mainstream media in all its diversity still remains hugely important, and many activists are acutely aware of this. Hence, dissenters, even radical ones, engage in what social movement scholar Peter Luke has called processes of adaptation to the media logic. From this perspective, it is being acknowledged that not all media are hostile to all media, to all movements. Allies can be found and used to get movement frames into the mainstream media uh, and, and into the mainstream public space. Lay knowledge of how media operates internally is playing an important role in this regard. More and more communication professionals engage themselves in protest movements to help out, to streamline communication and to perfect the art of what they call counter spinning. A good example of this is London uh, uh, Occupy uh, London Stock Exchange. <coughs> Yesterday, in one of my courses, I had two activists from their media team coming to talk to my students. One of them was an alumni of this university, and the other one had worked for the EPR for many years uh, and knew all the tricks of the trade. They hadn't slept for 48 hours. Uh, constantly on the phone with journalists running from one studio to the next uh, as yesterday night the uh, camp in St. Paul's was uh, uh, emptied. Um, one of the lessons they learned, for example, was to keep the right-wing media and the tabloids as close as possible engaging with them rather than only hating them. They wanted to talk to the deputy editor of the Evening Standard, build links with feature desks rather than with news teams, uh, as they knew that uh, feature desks usually have a little bit more freedom uh, in, from, uh, compared to the news desks. They combine the innovative use of social media with a thorough understanding of the news production process, using both interchangeably to their advantage. It is in, within this broad context that science intervention today that can be situated. And as such, without further delay, I would like to invite Simon uh, to the floor. But let me remind you first that there is a reception in the uh, senior common room on the fifth floor of this building, uh, uh, the old building on, uh, on the other side of the street, uh, right after uh, the talk which you all could find. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, my opening uh, PowerPoint, uh, as you can see, I don't know if you might want to bring the lights down a little bit just so you can see the uh, images a little bit more clearly, um, really illustrate, I think, two sides of the coin, a critical coin, which is very often uh, tossed in the air when we are starting to try and think about riots and rebellions. On the one hand, uh, we have an image of mainstream media. Uh, we might say this is the uh, politics of representation being played out uh, in a way which is pretty much business as usual in reference to the urban riots of uh, all this last year. And on your right, uh, we have an image that is referring, obviously, to uh, the Arab uprising and Egypt in particular, and is signalling the role of new media uh, in those events. Two very different takes, if you will, on the role of media in uh, recent uh, upheavals. And I think uh, that there is a tendency in the field, I think, to fall on one side of the fence or the other. And the underlying thesis of this lecture this evening is but I think we need to bring both closer together. Certainly, Time magazine, a mainstream American uh, uh, publication, <coughs> thinks that we are indeed in the time of the protest. The time, once a year, as you probably know, um, um, celebrates the person of the year. In 2011, the protester uh, won uh, Time's recognition and acknowledgement. And it has been an amazing year or two years, has it not? There have been protests and demonstrations before, of course. Many have fallen off the media map. But in the last year, last two years, uh, we've witnessed, I think, some historically momentous events. Um, events in relation to the Arab Spring, of course, which will take years and generations, I suspect, to fully appreciate um, uh, their significance. But so too have we witnessed urban riots in Britain, and we are seeing massive demonstrations uh, in Europe, um, and we are seeing uh, events like the Occupy movement, which are seemingly challenging, I think, uh, uh, capitalist inequality uh, with a, a view towards social justice issues. Um, we are living in tumultuous times. My, my uh, uh, um, intervention, if it is such a thing, uh, really, as I say, is, is drawing upon some of the things I've written in the past. This isn't just to show you that I've written a few books, it's simply to indicate, I think, that um, I have some limited forms of involvement with media politics. My first book was based on uh, the urban riots in the 1980s, so it gives me a vantage point from which to appraise, I think, uh, the role of media in relation to the urban riots of uh, uh, last year. Um, I also wrote a book about the Stephen Lawrence case, which, to my mind, demonstrated the way in which the mainstream media can occasionally, exceptionally, play a more performative and I think quite progressive role in relation to some social issues, and that's something which we need to hang on to, I think. Uh, my books on mediatized conflict and global crisis reporting are suggesting that there is a complexity in the field of media and communications, uh, that grid analyses of mainstream media as well as social media uh, are unlikely, I think, to hold much promise when we inspect them through a prism of previous uh, research and understanding. And my latest book, which is an edited book, uh, has some excellent things in it because I didn't write them, but they are written <coughs> by uh, some experts in the field looking at transnational protests. And that's interesting too, isn't it? The way in which I think protests increasingly now adopt and uh, aspire to and champion transnational issues and themes. They're not simply about material interests that are located in national contexts. They are very often motivated by what one, one might term, I think, a cosmopolitan ethic. So these types of massive protests, uh, very often, for example, coordinated protests around the world in relation to issues such as, for example, what's happening in Darfur, uh, signal, I think, that there is something abroad, there is something shifting in contemporary culture and politics, which is vitalizing politics, and it's doing it in a way which is internationally oriented. Well, what am I going to do in this lecture? Let, let me try and set out a few, um, a few aims. Uh, what, what I'd like to do in this lecture is to interrogate 
earlier findings from the research literature because I think they may still have promise in terms of helping us understand contemporary events. But so too may you want to uh, chip away at some of those uh, orthodoxic findings uh, and think about some of the complexities involved. Secondly, I also think we need to think about obviously the changing media and communication environment and how it's much more complicated uh, than it has been in the past. And there I want to challenge two tendencies, either a dystopian or a utopian tendency to try and celebrate new social media as somehow a, a democratic um, panacea, if you like, for the failings of mainstream media. My argument, as I suggested earlier on, is that I think the real story that needs to be told is the interpen interpenetration or implication of old and new media. And if we are simply looking at one and criticizing it, or looking at the other and perhaps celebrating it, you may well be in danger of losing something of the political contingency in the way in which protest and media can unfold through a dynamic interaction through time. That can be more complicated than I think sometimes people um, may well be suggesting at the moment. So that's what's on our agenda. And if you'll bear with me, I'll move us through this and we can have some discussion about this, hopefully, uh, towards the end. Well, what about past findings and beyond? Let me just talk about two, stu two studies very briefly that I think help to exemplify something of uh, the critical framing and academic thinking about protests and demonstrations in relation to the media uh, in the past. And these findings still inform, I think, much contemporary thinking today and perhaps for good reason. Now, the first study uh, by Todd Gitlin, uh, a celebrated uh, media academic, called The Whole World is Watching, Media and the Making and Unmaking of the New Left, was a study for, of the uh, students for a democratic society in America. It's an in-depth uh, study that explores that critical interdependence between media and demonstration and protest. As many theorists have noted, uh, protesters, demonstrators, and indeed activists require mainstream media if they are to disseminate and distribute their messages and their, their aims to a wider public than those people who have already signed up if you will, to their particular uh, uh, political uh, project. The mainstream media is needed if we want to try and legitimize or gain legitimacy for our public claims and aims. So there is an important dependence, at least historically, upon mainstream media um, for protests and demonstrations to really uh, resonate with the wider, within the wider polity that uh, we have to engage, in, with, engage with mainstream media. This is a, a little quote from Todd Gidman, uh, having appraised this uh, interaction critically. He said, the important point is that the movement paid a high price for the publicity it claimed and needed entered into an unequal contest with the media. Although it affected coverage, the movement was always the petitioner. The movement was more vulnerable, the media more determined. And in this in-depth study, Todd Gitlin uh, eloquently and accurately, I think, portrays the nature of that media coverage um, that was uh, focusing upon uh, students for democratic society. Uh, the new left, if you will, in America in the late 60s and the 1970s. And he argues and demonstrates and documents uh, the way in which the media, particularly in terms of its language, uh, denigrated, demonized, produced, if you like, uh, the personalities and the politics uh, of the demonstrators, the students for a democratic society. And that finding has been rehearsed time and time and time again in numerous studies. Uh, involving uh, political contention within civil society, whether it's in relation to the environmental movement, feminism, uh, the civil rights movement in the 1970s in Northern Ireland, and a whole host of other forms of urban unrest and contention. There is a, a, an identification of the way in which language is used to label and denigrate and delegitimize uh, both the politics and the personalities involved. That's one study. A second study I would like to talk about briefly, and we'll focus a little bit more on image um, in relation to this, is a study by James Halloran 
friend who got them for the Pelio in 1970. So we're going some time back into the past now. And it was based upon a demonstration in 1968 that was spearheaded, you might be interested to hear, uh, by people uh, at the London School of Economics. <laughs> Carrie Kelly, for example, was a, a leader in this uh, demonstration, which was a, a protest against uh, Britain uh, connivance and support of the American government uh, war in uh, Vietnam. Let me just tell you something about this demonstration and we'll get to this uh, famous picture. Something like 70,000 people were on this march protesting against the British support of the American government. Um, and this march had been agreed with uh, the police authorities in a particular route. About two to 3,000 demonstrators broke away from the main body of the march to uh, um, uh, take their, their protest to the American embassy. About 50 police officers Formed, the British police officers formed a cordon around the uh, American embassy, and a scuffle with about 50 demonstrators broke out uh, between uh, those protesters and the police. In the middle of that melee, in the middle of that scuffle, one particular police officer, an unfortunate police officer, fell to the ground, and as he was falling to the ground, he was kicked in the head by a protester, a violent uh, individual uh, act. That image was captured by uh, a photo agency, and that image became, if you like, the symbolic image of that protest and demonstration. And that was used on, I think it was something like 8 out of 10 of all British national newspapers, for the most part on the front page. Graham Murdoch subsequently made a, an eloquent and critical argument about this, saying that this symbolic image effectively emptied out, it emptied out the politics at the heart of the march. The collective violence of one nation state against uh, the peoples of another potential nation state, which was at the heart of this politics, became displaced by the interpersonal violence between uh, a group of demonstrators and this one particular police officer. That was the way in which that march became delegitimized, and the role of a highly symbolic image within that was instrumental to that political process. So, issues of language and issues of visual symbolization can be key to how we perceive uh, a protest and whether we get to hear the issues that are animating that protest at all. Fortunately, um, today, we might think that we live in a world of media plenty. Uh, every man, woman, and child, it seems, as their mobile phone that is now capable, at least in our country, capable of taking pictures, of uh, recording images. There is no deficit of pictures. So in a protest or a demonstration, you could quite confidently predict that potentially thousands upon thousands of images would have been collected and would be circulating on the internet and elsewhere. So when we come to the urban riots in Britain uh, last year, in August, uh, thankfully, this situation of media dependency upon one particular image uh, will no longer be the case. There will be a plurality for their number of imagery because that is the nature of the communication environment that we have it. Well, okay, I got that wrong in relation to um, you know, the lower uh, marketplace of uh, tabloid newspapers. So the Daily Star, Anarchy in the UK, one particular image of a, a hooded person on the streets there in front of a, a, a burning, like burning flames. And there's some, actually it's remarkably similar, similar to anarchy, riots spread across the world. <coughs> Birmingham hit by losing 215 arrests. Okay, well that's the lower end of the newspaper. Um, fortunately, we have more diversity of the British uh, newspaper system. Uh, we have mid-market newspapers, popular newspapers, the Daily Express and the Daily Mail. Uh, it's the same picture, isn't it? Yes, it is. No, it is the same picture. Right, okay. I'm going to have to revise my uh, optimistic upbeat view of the media. Flaming neurons, says the Daily Express. The anarchy spreads, says the Daily Mail. But we do have policy newspapers, so come on, we can hang on to that idea, can't we? We're not going to be offered just a uniform view of the European rights of Britain, are we? We're going to have differing editorial outlooks, different political perspectives. 
<laughs> the Guardian and the Independent, which are two notable and in many ways uh, reputable, I think, and good newspapers, and I, I do not say that uh, tongue in cheek at all. But here you see the same picture, the same picture, the Battle for London and the Independent in North Moon. I've been trying to get hold of the uh, photojournalist that took that picture. Imagine he's bought himself a whole house on the basis of his <laughs> success, that kind of, kind of entrepreneurial capitalism at work in the open alliance, one might think. Um, but I haven't been able to get hold of him yet, but I did try, and I will keep trying, because I think it's amazing, absolutely amazing, that in this day and age, that all these newspapers with different editorial angles can have what Brian Murdoch would have said a few years ago was a, a form of ideological convergence, that they are all talking same language seemingly, and they are all using the same image. Oh, one. Just in case we thought they might be. Uh, there were two newspapers that didn't go to that picture. Uh, the Times, although the use of language mob rules as police are in the streets, and New York rules as the daily. So I don't think ideologically we're getting much uh, uh, increased uh, perspective in the way I use them. But nevertheless, thankfully, at least two pictures are different. And there they all are. They're a bit like ideological foot soldiers, aren't they? All kind of lined up on the hegemonic parade uh, for our readership. Um, amazing, I think. Amazing. So maybe, maybe the critical views that have been established in earlier studies are still with us. They still have relevance. They can still capture something of what's happening in the mainstream media. Um, does it matter? Yeah, well, I think it does matter, and this is what the early critical theorists uh, would have argued as well, that representation matters, it can have real consequences, it can flow into general perceptions, it can create a form of hysteria, it may well also enter into the world of policy making and you know, the august institutions of society, and it can have real repercussions for the individuals involved as well as the wider community. And here's a, a, a little uh, extract from The Independent, just to remind me, really, of the sentencing that followed in, in response to those uh, events. A mother of, let me just read a couple of A mother of two was given a five-month sentence yesterday for accepting shorts stolen by someone else. Ursula had been 24 was asleep during the riots. But she took the shorts, which were part of a stash of clothing taken by a flatmate, flatmate Jenna Corbett. Uh, maybe never. On Thursday, a 23-year-old was sent to prison for six months for stealing a £3.50 case of water from Riddle. A 43-year-old was still being held in prison for stealing items worth £1 from a newsagent. That, I suspect, is an indication of the extent to which there was a public climate of fear and anxiety that may well have been, I suspect, generated by that type of uniform media coverage that uh, accompanied uh, those early days, first uh, days, if you like, of the urban riots. But that's not the only discourse that we've heard in relation to those events. We've also heard a lot being said about new media, about Facebook, and about Twitter, and about Blackberry. Um, Twitter, according to research I think that's been conducted by uh, The Guardian, and also people at the LSC, I understand, uh, is not necessarily so instrumentally involved as was first thought. There were claims being circulated that you know, these are Twitter revolutions or Facebook, Facebook uh, um, riots, that people are using this technology to coordinate and, and uh, um, to congregate in certain areas at uh, pre agreed times. So actually, the research is suggesting uh, a more complex picture that very often the Twitter traffic, for example, increases after the events themselves rather than preceding them. Uh, nevertheless, Blackberry does seem to have played a more important role in relation to these events um, in terms of generating the capacity of particularly young people to amass, to mobilize, uh, what might call this uh, smart mobs, I guess, in terms of arriving at certain localities uh, to engage in criminal activity finding goods and so on, uh, stealing goods, and then disappearing. 
Uh, the police were wrong-footed, as we know. They were institutionally in blocks, uh, heavily tooled up if they could find uh, the equipment in that short space of time. And by the time they'd arrived at a, a locality where they knew something was happening, and somebody had told them it was happening, so the, the mob had disappeared and were likely to uh, engage in activities somewhere else. So there was a, a tactical, if you like, uh, speed uh, question here, an issue of speed that uh, the police were, if you like, convinced with. That was quite different to the riots of the 1980s. Uh, it was a very different type of uh, urban engagement. It was less about set two pieces, if you will, it was more about mobility and fluidity, and no doubt the technology uh, was quite a part of that. There were calls for censorship as well, as we know, which was a bit ironic following the Arab Spring, where people were very critical, for example, of Gaddafi and Mubarak and others who were trying to censor uh, technologies, the internet and the telephony uh, and the rest, in order to uh, control and maintain political control. So that idea uh, fell on, well, it fell full of deaf ears, but it didn't actually come to pass. All right, so there are some differences there, but there are certainly some continuities. Maybe, however, there were also always more complexities even years ago in terms of mainstream media coverage. And I'd just like to say a few words about that. But when we look at riots and disorders, uh, issues of space, time, and genre can be quite crucial. Um, so, for example, uh, I remember when the Los Angeles riots in 1992, I think it was, uh, kicked off, that the British newspapers were full of images there, uh, taken from the uh, demonstrators' uh, point of view on the serial ranks of newspapers. I'm sorry, I don't have a, an image to show you. Uh, that there was a certain perspective that was a critical perspective, if you like, that was framing the way in which uh, law and order was being uh, deployed in Los Angeles. There was, there was more sympathy, essentially, towards what was happening. Partly because that followed on uh, the events of Rodney King, who I thought we'll talk about later, uh, a black man who was uh, beaten by the police, had a court on uh, video cam, and the LAPD officers were subsequently acquitted. That sparked the Los Angeles riots. Um, so, space. We can, the British media can very often be much more critical of uh, political power and authority, it seems, but it's not anywhere in the back of the army. But also time, events that have occurred in Britain in the past, um, take the suffragette movement, for example, can now be looked at through a very different and more sympathetic prism than would have been the case by the media at that time. And of course, time isn't only you know, in, uh, historically, it's not just that historical temporality, it can also be time in quite a short space of time, if you like. So now we're seeing current affairs and documentary programs on the urban riots that are opening up, if you like, a space, an opportunity for, for a more differentiated array of views and perspectives. And so here we see on the uh, right, uh, just a, a little snapshot from the internet, reminding me, and perhaps you, of a program that went out a couple of weeks ago called My Child, the Riot. It's a very different framing to your rule that was being kind of the established uh, rhetoric of the mainstream press. Um, a, few, a few months earlier. So the institutional opportunity or the institutional control and containment of different genres across space and time can very often open up, if you like, more possibilities, more opportunities for different views and voices. And that's important. I, I suspect that has also been the case in the past. In fact, I know it has. My first book demonstrated that with current affairs, documentary, and, and filmic forms of representation. That reminds me that mainstream media has always formed what has now increasingly been termed the media ecology, that there are differentiated forms in, and institutional arrangements that can open up differing political possibilities as well as containing and closing down <coughs> political opportunities of voice and viewpoint. Well, if that's something about earlier research, I'd just like to say a few words now about more current thinking, now some of the debates that perhaps we might want to think about when we're trying to make an evaluation 
of the more complex media environment, undoubtedly more complex media environment than was uh, the case uh, even um, just a few years ago, the arrival of uh, social media and its proliferating forms. So I'm going to run through a few debates and, and I'll just point out, I think, some of the other dimensions of complexity that, as I say, we might want to think about. So I'm going to talk about politically mediated control and then transnational communications. I'll talk about the scaling up and scaling down of protests through uh, today's media uh, environment. I want to talk about delegitimizing framing, but also political dramaturgy and how that can open up new possibilities. We need to think about the language and the visuals of the public sphere. This is uh, what some people would refer to as public screens. We certainly have to think about old media and new media, and I'll then finally talk about how we might want to start thinking about the imbrication or the interpenetration between old and new media as a necessary uh, as a necessary uh, departure if we want to make sense of today's communication environment. Well, let me take the first of those first. I know the picture there of um, Hector Peterson young uh, schoolboy, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, who was shot in Soweto in 1976 by uh, a, a photographer. This image circulated around the world, and I have no doubt that it became a highly simple, one of those very iconic images, if you like, that helped to um, animate uh, the growing concern about apartheid and the anti and gave, if you like, a vector of uh, energy to uh, the anti-apartheid movement. The photographer who, take, who took that uh, image had to hide the film in his sock because the South African authorities uh, were after him. He was the only photographer in that part of Soweto that took images that day, and he basically he had to flee for his life. Um, and he, he didn't uh, practice uh, photojournalism uh, again, uh, not at least in that part of uh, in, uh, uh, South Africa. His newspaper was also then shut down, the world was shut down a few weeks after that. That tells us something, because of a couple of things, doesn't it? It tells us about the way in which political power will try and contain and control and censor by intimidation, if it would be, uh, the production and the circulation of images. And there are a number of models that help us explain this. Uh, the Manufacturing Consent Model by Herman and Chomsky, but there are slightly more dynamic, I think, political dynamic models, such as the elite indexing model with, uh, by, written by, coined by Lance Bennett, uh, which is a much more politically contingent and fluid understanding of the way in which the changing um, interaction between protesters um, or political activists and political power takes place through time. The model goes like this, and I think it's important. Uh, it tells us that in a time of elite consensus, it's quite likely that the media will fall in line with uh, that political viewpoint. In that sense, it's similar to the manufacturing consent model. However, when elites, the political elite or the political establishment becomes fractured and there are differing viewpoints and arguments, at that point, very often, the media can become involved and it may even, on occasions, champion a more critical and independent stance. I like that model because sociologically it relates the dynamics of media and political, and political apparatus and, and it tells us how things can move through time and how sometimes there are opportunities and sometimes there are closures and it's important to try and understand how that can happen. My next image that reflects on this, those types of models and actually starts to qualify them, I think, uh, it's an image taken from the front page of the Independent, uh, and this was, as you all recall, the kind of global political crisis that was sparked by the Israeli uh, assault on protesters on flotilla of ships that were making their way to Gaza to try and break the embargo on uh, incoming goods uh, that were needed uh, to sustain the population of Gaza. The Israeli forces. Uh, um, 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 put themselves on those ships, on the radio those ships, um, and a number of people were shot. This whole event was recorded on video. Some of it was being, being live uh, around the world. Uh, 
Those types of images could not have been contained in the way that the South African government was trying to contain them. It was out, it was circulating. Uh, there were protests uh, uh, outside Israeli embassies in many countries around the world. There was a whole, if you like, a political trajectory that became unleashed because of the role that communications was playing uh, within that. This, I think, suggests that maybe even <coughs> models of uh, elite indexing may be too nationally prescribed by now working in a transnational communications environment that can sometimes uh, overcome those forms of attempted political control and containment. Protests and demonstrations, as I said earlier, are now increasingly transnationally oriented. It's not just about us in our own uh, vested interests in particular situations. They can speak to issues that have a transnational cosmopolitan um, charge. Uh, sometimes this transnationalism can become embedded in local actions. Uh, an example of a local action might be two solitary uh, protesters in the Tasmanian wilderness um, just two or three years ago uh, chained themselves to an old car, uh, con uh, a concrete stump in the road, to try and stop the logging company um, cutting down ancient uh, uh, wilderness forests. The loggers started to beat up on these protesters. There were no journalists and no photojournalists around, but there was a, a, an activist, a protester, uh, in, in the bushes, uh, video camera, with a video camera, who caught this on film. That then went on to the internet, it then went to the mainstream Australian, uh, the mainland of Australia. Um, that then raised uh, questions in the House of Parliament in uh, Australia, but then it also um, went international, if you like. So that environmental protest had a charge, uh, had a, a resonance for uh, environmental protesters around the world. Some protests are national protests, but they still have a transnational uh, um, aspiration in the sense that they require international legitimation and international recognition. Um, the Tibet pro protest in 2008, for example, uh, timed at the same year as the Olympics, uh, was certainly seeking that international recognition. Some transnational issues are deliberately pursued by protesters, but they do so in the knowledge that they also have to embed within their movement national concerns as a way of building a movement. So national issues get taken up as a way of building support and then hopefully encouraging a more transnational orientation. Um, there's a great chapter in my edited collection by two Turkish scholars that talked about the risk of resistance for movement in Turkey and exactly how they did this. That's a kind of form of rooted cosmopolitanism. And there's also, and this is what perhaps sometimes we all think as the natural home of transnational protests, there are protests that are dealing with global issues, um, which we might actually call unrooted cosmopolitanism. Um, where we are dealing with issues that it is hoped that everybody can recognise are a global concern. Let me talk about one uh, area, one um, study that has looked at uh, that particular type of protest. Now, this is a study by David Crouch and uh, Katerina Damaginov, uh, who have a chapter in my book. And they're talking about uh, piracy at the link, uh, the Sea Shepherd and the spectacle of protest on the high seas. Uh, this was uh, protesters uh, going to the southern nations to protest uh, uh, the Japanese whaling fleet and the continuing coming of whales. Uh, and this is a little quote that just gives us a flavour of what was happening in a communicative uh, sense. Almost instantaneously, they say, images are spread across the globe via satellite uplink webcams and around the clock internet broadly. Sea Shepherd takes their environmental protest in its remote and unforgiving location, impossibly beyond everyday reach, and broadcasts it back to the world, disseminating it through the internet and broader sphere. They constantly send out fresh broadcast quality images and a barrage of news releases, twitters and updates of events. By staging their anti voting protest to spectacular pirate attacks, they also exploit elements of popular culture, tapping into the social imagination of a potentially transnational public sphere. 
And here's a few images, if you like. You might have seen some of these. A series of programs was made based upon this protest. It makes for riveting uh, TV. It seems to um, conform to some uh, basic news values of drama, of potential violence. Um, but nevertheless, it also becomes a vehicle for disseminating the politics and the sense of disgust, if you like, entertained by these protesters uh, in this particular context. That also speaks to the power of spectacle, I think. Brian Murdoch, when he was talking about the anti-Vietnam War demonstration a few years ago, said that the spectacle of that protest, the way in which violence, if you like, framed it, emptied out the politics. I think now there is an increasing recognition that spectacle and drama can also become a vehicle for politics. It's a way, if you like, of captivating attention, and it's a way of adding an emotional and effective charge to politics. And politics always does need uh, the emotional and the effective that is if it's to really make us think and feel. It's not always the case that images are delegitimizing in the context of protests either. Um, this is a, a great image. We could expand thousands of words about the semiotic play of signifiers and how they're all kind of moving in the same direction here. But it's a direction, you know, which I think we could all agree because we're all semioticians. We all read culture in that moment of instantaneous kind of recognition or acknowledgement. We can see here that, you know, where is the threat and who is vulnerable and, uh, you know, it's actually reversing that kind of semantic field that we might have expected in the context of protest. So I'm not the same, I'm not going to do the semiotic analysis, I think we can all see that. All right, so there is a complexity then there in terms of the nature of the uh, images and the way in which drama or dramaturgy can sometimes be deliberately staged to capture uh, news interest but it can also become a vehicle for political ideas uh, and aspirations. This, in terms of academic terms, very often gets played out in relation to two overarching concepts. And I don't want to give you too, too much of a lecture, I suppose, but on the one hand, we have a rationalistic model of the public sphere as articulated most eloquently by uh, Jürgen Habermas. Um, and it's an argument which some people have picked up on uh, in relation to um, uh, the rise of new social, new, uh, new social media. Uh, in Iran, for example, there's a quotation here from Nazanin uh, Ganavizi, who argues that the habit in public sphere, which is based on the dialogic articulation of ideas and interests, establishes the ground for the formation of public opinion. Shared ideas form as interacting private individuals' search for recognition. And um, her argument, uh, we wouldn't unpack all this quote, her argument is that in Iran, in the run-up to the 2009 elections, uh, the cyberspace for Iranians uh, became a, a very important medium, if you like, in which civil society could start to recognize its ambitions. But people could, with a degree of security, not complete security, but they could start to articulate their arguments and ideas in a way that formerly wouldn't have been possible within the public space, if you like, of an urban environment. So this became a seedbed for ideas and a, a seedbed for recognizing uh, the degree to which there is opposition and that perhaps you are not alone. A couple of theorists have been particularly influential, uh, I think, in arguing that that's a very rationally and narrowly conceived understanding of public discourse and deliberation in the contemporary mediated world. And they argue but we should actually be thinking about public screens. I, it's about image, it's about hypermediacy, and if you think about it, it's from pages of newspapers are screens in the sense that they're based on imagery and symbolization. But we're surrounded by screens, we receive so much of our information, so we really have to become increasingly sensitized to the nature of these particular media. And this is what they say, they say, in comparison to the rationality and all these conversations, census and civility of the public sphere, the public screen highlights dissemination, images, hypermediacy, spectacular publicity, cacophony, distraction, and dissent. 
We focused on the image event as one practice of the public screen because it highlights the public screen as an alternative venue for participatory politics and public opinion formation that offers a striking contrast to the public sphere. The two very differing takes, if you will, on the nature of communications and how communications can become embedded within uh, the politics of protests and the articulation and the formation of public opinion. These arguments play out in relation to discussions of the media and how we might want to evaluate them. Well, here's some more public screens, I guess. Old media, but still doing what old media as uh, understood by Graham Murdoch does. Here's another instance of how an image can dominate uh, uh, front pages of newspapers. This is the uh, student protest against uh, the rising uh, fees and the withdrawal of EMA, the uh, Educational Maintenance Allowance, that uh, had some violent scenes, and one image yet again has dominated all those front pages. How remarkable and disappointing. But of course there's new media now also entering into the fray. Uh, these are all images that we've all seen before. Uh, the beating of Rodney King, captured by a passerby on a video cam. Uh, he complained to the uh, Los Angeles Police Department of uh, this police brutality being meted out to this uh, Rodney, King, Rodney King driver. Um, the police department ignored him, so he went to, his, uh, to a, a, a news company, TV news company, and it was broadcast. And it then went viral around the world uh, with a whole range of repercussions later on. Um, on your top right, of course, there's an image that uh, some people have argued is the most watched human death in history. This poor, unfortunate uh, young woman, uh, Neda Arthur Sultan, who was shot uh, by, America, uh, by Iranian uh, security forces uh, when she was demonstrating uh, in support of. 2009 elections and, and the way in which that election didn't give democratic voice. That film footage is terrible to watch. Uh, it's been on the internet through YouTube and we witnessed her, her death and her dying. It's circulated around the globe. And then, of course, the images of Ian Tomlinson, a uh, newspaper so I caught up in the uh, GA protest, uh, shoved to the floor by a police officer, captured on camera who subsequently died, and that then became a, a core celeb, if you like, of investigation into policing tactics and demonstrations and protests, opening up a possibility for a range of different voices and viewpoints. So new media seem to be offering us something new, as the term might uh, uh, imply. However, I think there is an unfortunate tendency, I think, in feel as I perceive it at the moment, um, for researchers either to go on to line up, if you like, on one side of the camp, investigating through a critical prison uh, old media, uh, or to be possibly adopting a rather celebratory uh, view of new social media. Um, and there's a, a different type of language and a different type of discourse that, that surrounds these. And here's my attempt to bring some sort of visual topography to it. It's a mess, isn't it, really? But we kind of live in messy times as, as from a media and communication environment, trying to trace those complexities. It's extraordinarily difficult. It's a methodological challenge as well. But this is my attempt, for what it's worth, just to kind of remind us of some of that complexity. Uh, Western news agencies still dominate uh, the globe in terms of uh, news footage, although there is uh, increasing uh, members of independent uh, news agencies. We need to look at mainstream press, and we need to look at the different types of newspapers, and we need to look at the different types of news programming and current affairs. And very often we do that in terms through a prism of political economy, and we recognize the hierarchy involved, and the control, and the competition, the pursuit of ratings, revenue, and readers. And we look at how that shapes and conditions uh, news discourse. But so too do we need to recognize the rise of the internet, uh, this kind of prickly uh, network, and that's the key term, isn't it, that we use, this network which is now offering new independent forms of communication as well as an implication with mainstream media, 
and an attempted colonization by mainstream media of this networked um, system. And here the language is all about networks. It's about participation, it's about interaction, it's about uh, mass uh, self-communication, um, it's about flows and it's about fluidity. It's about horizontal, uh, uh, bottom-up communications, if you like. And there's a whole discourse around this, I think, very often uh, uh, couched in terms of participatory uh, democracy. But when we actually look at protests and demonstrations, and I'll, I'll do very quickly in a moment, and in the context of the Arab Spring, I think the most interesting argument, so I said so three times now, that it's about the interpenetration, it's about the interactions, and how these interpenetrations and interactions play out over time in relation to the unfolding political process. And there's a tendency to essentialize the discussion as well as bifurcated into a dualistic kind of way of thinking about these things. Um, and if you went back and just thought about this, all these forms of new social media, in fact, you know, that went on the internet, but it then became played out in relation to mainstream media, the Rugby King event, as did Adder Malka Sultan's uh, death, that became picked up in mainstream media. The death of Ian Tomlinson was championed by the Guardian newspaper, particularly investigating uh, what had happened and then raising awkward and difficult questions of institutional power. These things do not have an independent, if you like, critical life of their own. If they are to have that wider charge and wider effect on people who aren't necessarily embroiled in the immediacy and the politics of uh, these various events and the surrounding political issues, uh, mainstream media is still absolutely essential. Here's a, a possible kind of example that gives some credence to my argument. AB, the Daily Mail, which is not known for its sympathetic uh, coverage of the Occupy movement, uh, I was struck actually uh, on this internet version that this picture came to light. Throwing punches and mowing them down with motorbikes, the shocking video which proved brutal police overstepped the mark with Wall Street protesters. All right. There's a degree of modality, as critical linguists, uh, linguists would point out here, the fact that they put in uh, quotation marks, prove which was really so to step the mark, you know, suggesting that that may not be the case. But actually, when we read this and we see the image, that does seem to have captivated the editorial outlook of the Daily Mail. Front page of The Independent, this is going back to the Saffron Revolution in Burma in 2007. Uh, a blogger's words are now superimposed on the front page of the mainstream newspaper, <coughs> telling us about what's happening. Police, riot police and soldiers are beating monks. I saw a truck full of police with guns. They're using tear gas bombs against the crowd and so on. These very visceral, emotionally charged, personalized accounts now become, if you like, entering from the mainstream uh, and are dis distributed and disseminated in part through the mainstream. Lorraine's Secret Terror. Again, the independent, you can see which paper I read the most. Um, desperate email, emails speak of genocide as doctors with treating injured protesters around the gun. I'm using newspapers simply because it's kind of easier for me to do that. But if you think about what's been happening in Syria recently, and look at some of the imagery that's been coming out of Syria, which I don't know about you, but it certainly had a, a, a fine sort of emotional uh, effect on me, I think. Those images are being circulated. Yes, you find them on the internet if you look on YouTube and elsewhere. But for the most part, most people are recognizing them, if you like, uh, indirectly bearing witness to what's happening, in and through their in incorporation into mainstream media. And I, I just think that's important. I think, you know, before we talk about social media in splendid isolation, we really need to think about how they are becoming implicated uh, with uh, changing, subtly changing, sometimes, sometimes dramatically changing mainstream coverage. Which brings me to the concluding part of my lecture, and I just want to talk about three arguments that possibly flesh out some of my um, uh, generalizing claim. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what happened in the Middle East, and particularly in relation to um, Egypt. 
and I'm going to talk about cell phones, camels, and the global call for democracy, cell phones. Um, <coughs> when these events started to happen in the early months of last year, people started to talk about the Twitter revolutions and the Facebook revolutions. And that was an indication of me and what I'm talking about, I think, the way in which perhaps too quickly there is a, a tendency to identify the role of social media as if that was a causative agent and as if that was the only form of media and communications involved in those events. There is no doubt that new social media have played a, an important, sometimes a profound role in what's been happening in the Middle East. But it would be a mistake, it would be a short-circuiting of both the political complexity and also the media complexity if we only focused upon those particular uh, forms. So some people have argued, for example, that you know, these events have become organized uh, on Facebook and they've become, if you like, played out to a wider uh, audience through Twitter. They then get taken up by 24-7 news channels like Al Jazeera and the rest and distributed around the world. Cell phones have played an important part in many of these um, events and that's not surprising. There are now 5 billion phones in the world four million of them are actually in the developed world. But they're not smartphones necessarily. But nevertheless, they have played a role in relation to particular segments of the population who are involved in uh, these particular protests and events, all of which have their own unique political history, and all of which are unraveling, if you like, uh, within, with their own degree of uh, political trajectory, with their own form of political unraveling. Sometimes disastrously so, as we're witnessing for in the context of many people, sometimes the remarkable fluidity and the seeming ease in overthrowing uh, what was formerly would be perceived as being deeply embedded, I'm frankly, I'm sorry, deeply embedded uh, institutions of power. So, cell phones and new technologies have played and will continue to play, I'm sure, in, in, in a very important role in these events, although we might want to periodize that and see how, what type of roles they played at what particular moments, and how that's changing through time. I was struck when I was watching these events unfold for the first time, actually how the media, contrary to that earlier critical expectation of academics, was actually not what I was witnessing on the mainstream media, particularly in broadcasting, for example. Um, there seemed to be a more speedy recognition, I felt, uh, of the democratic legitimacy of those protests uh, than was being uh, the official viewpoint, if you like, of uh, politicians and the elites. And that seemed to challenge, once again, the kind of political expectations of established models in the field, like manufacturing consent, or like the elite indexing model, or like the political contest model of Gabby Wallstone i the journalists seem to be getting there sooner, if you like, in terms of recognizing what was happening and giving voice to them. And that was doubly a surprise for me. It was a surprise uh, in terms of the critical kind of academic framing that one might have uh, uh, followed through in relation to this broadcast coverage. But it also was surprising in the context of post-9-11, where the media one might, have, one might have assumed, would have immediately assumed that this was radical Islam, fundamentalism, you know, uh, uh, um, um, on the march, if you like. And then there was a moment, for a day or two, when that actually seemed to be the kind of knee-jerk reaction to mainstream media. But they very quickly changed, at least uh, in Britain, the, the programs I saw. In part, I think that's to do through the way in which uh, social media were alerting um, organizations like the BBC to the different views and the different, um, um, literally different views and also the kind of political views that were in play. The BBC now is being bombarded by social media and text and imagery. And, and subsequent to the 2009 uh, Iranian situation, we're now much more geared up, if you want, to listening to that and trying to make sense of it. But there were other factors also at work. So it's not just about technology, it's also about symbolism and dramaturgy, which is something I wanted to pick up on earlier on. This symbolic value of Tiria Square, which had already had a symbolic resonance in Egypt, uh, became, if you like, a symbol of the democratic movement, at least for Western audiences, and maybe people, many people in Egypt as well, I suspect. 
It was a demonstration of democracy at work. Here was a group of people, uh, thousands of people who were, many of whom were under threat and under assault. As we know, over 800 people lost their lives in Egypt. Um, they were in this square demonstrating their civility, demonstrating, if you like, their, their call for increased uh, democracy and for increased social justice. Coptic Christians uh, protected praying Muslims. Uh, people discussed, they read poetry, they sang songs. There's a com communal environment, if you like, that was symbolized in this particular event. Uh, and it was a rich kind of invigoration of civil society. On film. This was a highly dramatic kind of filmic uh, sequence. Um, and there were many sequences like that that were picked up by cameras. There is something about that drama dramaturgy which uh, can, if you like, resonate with audiences. You can see the action and you can possibly see the politics or are more likely to be sympathetic to the politics when we see them. But that's a second explanation. It's the role of new technologies. There's also this symbolism and the dramaturgy of the events themselves that can become a powerful vehicle for discharging the the legitimation, if you like, of the democratic will of what was happening in Egypt. And there was also the role of uh, mainstream 24-7 uh, news journalists who were involved in these activities. They were in the heart of the crowd, experiencing the sense of threat, experiencing the joy and the exhilaration of that sense of collective power that we know that people can feel when they combine together and suddenly start to challenge a system that they would have formerly perhaps experienced as formidable and uh, uh, unmovable. Journalists and correspondents, so sociologists of war tell us, become embedded in relation to the military and that can shape their perspective and their outlook on war. And in part that is rooted in what could be termed a phenomenological experience of what's happening in that context. That in a situation of war, civil norms and civil expectations uh, are discarded, if not immediately, uh, incrementally. That is what wars are all about, that military are killing machines that are designed to kill people. And if you're a journalist and a correspondent uh, involved in that, so you are likely, particularly if you've been uh, a subject of a minder, for example, in the case of the Falklands War, you will, and you will start to experience uh, that war in and through a kind of militarized uh, prism of understanding. But I think there are other forms of embedding, and this is what I personally term beneficent embedding, or a positive form of embedding. Uh, there, there can be other situations of duress, there can be other situations of um, uh, jeopardy, if you like experienced by journalists or witnessed by them, which will put them in a position where they are more likely to become acutely aware of the issues and the politics surrounding the events that they are witnessing. And sometimes humanitarian famines and catastrophes uh, may well be one such situation. And I think, and disasters, major disasters, we can also find uh, examples of that. Uh, but so too, I think there was something of that at work in the way in which correspondents were responding to the events in Egypt, recognizing their legitimacy and understanding <coughs> something of the um, political animus that was driving those people to risk life and limb. Why? Because they themselves were subject to threats, and many of them were, were beaten. Uh, they witnessed terrible events and terrible scenes. So there is that kind of phenomenological experience of what's going on that would make them uh, more sympathetic and on side. And so too did they experience the um, exhilaration and that sense of collectivity and that sense of aspiration and hope. Um, I could have shown you some film footage but it would take too long. But I remember George Alegaya, for example, uh, into this square going around talking to people. And if you're almost like celebrating with the people themselves why they were there and their hopes and aspirations and becoming quite visibly excited by what he's witnessing. I don't blame him at all for that. I would have done the same. But that tells us something about, I think, of the importance of being there, of the role of correspondence, even when we are um, benefiting sometimes from this increasing social media explosion of uh, 
media voices and media images. So we're living in a world of complexity, and just to conclude, because I'm probably talking a little bit too long, um, my, my argument then is that we need to understand new and social media not in separate terms. We need to understand how they interact with old media, and we need to understand something of the complexity of both, and how that can uh, play a productive and, and progressive role even in, in relation to a number of protests and demonstrations that we're witnessing uh, in the world today. It's probably a good point to leave it. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, how models might apply to something which is possibly different to what you've been discussing. Your, what you've been discussing is the interaction between old media and new media. 
uh, and you know the mediatization of conflict in that manner. But what about um, uh, things which seem to be occurring now, which sort of sidestep old media and but still mediatize conflict? What I'm thinking of here, but not possibly explaining very well, are things like the State Department uh, in the U.S. and their digital out digital outreach team, which engages overtly with internet users uh, and manipulates media, but in an overt, uh, conscious, public fashion. I'm sure there are covert issues, things going on as well, but to me that is a new development and a new way of mediatising which has nothing to do with old media. And how, what, how do models apply to that? Okay, uh, I mean, I'm talking about protests and demonstrations and people on the streets. I, don't think that's, I think you're talking about the strategic use of social media by fiscal authorities and powers the way, if you like, or containing or closing public discourse and debate. Um, yes, that's certainly part of the media environment, isn't it? I'm not saying that there aren't issues of institutionalised power and institutionalised dominance. We're not talking about an equal weighting or a plurality of uh, different <coughs> media interests. Um, and yes, people will use whatever media are available for them to do. Um, but as I said, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not talking about demonstrations, um, politics of the streets, if you like, and how that becomes played out in the media. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm worried about the emphasis you gave to that singularity of the photo of the rioter and the events of last August. Yeah. Because I think it actually talks about some other things that you weren't mentioning. One is about how we imagine a good news photograph to be. Because I think that was a stunningly good photograph. And I think any news editor, photo editor in that sense would have chosen that one. Because the photo editor doesn't have the infinity of Twitter of um, mobile phone photographs. They have a limited channel of the photographs sent to them by the new, by the photo agencies. And if I compare the photograph that most of the papers chose with the two that weren't chosen, I know which one I think is the better photo. It has an individual figure in front of a dramatic image. And it was a photograph of an event that was bound to leave the front page. If we compare that to, say, 9-11, which where there was a multiplicity of dramatic images and the newspapers each chose different ones because they had a wider range of, of quotes, good images to choose from. So we're going to talk about the mixture of political and aesthetics of how photo journalism is represented. Um, Just go back to the image, sorry. I mean, it, that's, a bit, that's a really good news photograph. I mean, in terms of these photographs. I'm not surprised it was chosen by everyone from the Guardian to the Star. So, but then you say about how individual images become dominant, and we have the image of the kick from Grosvenor Square. But dissident images also force themselves in. In terms of Vietnam, the photograph of the Vietnamese South Vietnamese general holding a gun to the head of a Viet Cong, the young girl running away, covering napalm. They were distant images, but they e equally forced themselves to become a dominant representation image. Part of just how, how we understand the aesthetics of photojournalism and how those, how those photographs appear upon the desktops of the photo editors. Uh, no, that's a good question, I think. And, uh, it tells us something, doesn't it, about it? I suppose from a journalistic or photojournalistic viewpoint about the deep-seated nature of news values. And as you say, in that moment of recognition, we can see what is a good or not such a worthy photograph to put on the front page. Um, and I agree, you know, what, we, and we know what these things are, don't we? You know, drama, deviance, violence, you know, and, and both your, your accounts of different types of pictures would seem to be at play. The issue, therefore, However, so there's another issue at play, isn't it? It's the extent to which certain types of images become selected and positioned and editorially framed, if you like, in and through the use of language to convey a particular ideological viewpoint or to have a particular political viewpoint. And I would suggest that these types of images, when we see how they are juxtaposed in relation to language, and the linguistic cues, there's an editorial framing that is actually closing down our understanding of what these events are all about. I suppose it's conceivable that you could have a picture like this, couldn't you, and say something like, you know, what is it that's driven people to the streets here, you know, or the social despair erupts again, 
but we didn't have that. So that kind of suggests to me that maybe the, you know, the image and a lack of understanding or a lack of capacity to get out on the streets and talk to the people who are involved in here, their viewpoint, has closed down too soon, if you like, closed down too early. What could have been a, a quite valid um, and differentiated range of perspectives and accounts of what was happening. The whole thing closed down from remarkably similar. And actually, I, I would agree with you as well, in part, I think, in the sense that, you know, 24 7 news, you know, live news coverage. I was watching journalists on the streets, you know, and there they are confronted by somebody caving in a, a shop window. And they say, it's naked criminality, it's just crime. You couldn't possibly see this as anything other than that. You could, if you'd been a journalist and you'd understand something about, I suspect, about urban deprivation or the sense of grievance and aggravation. Or indeed, just by the side of the mindset of some of these young people, um, you might have actually interpreted that slightly uh, more generously. And, but that didn't happen. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. But uh, yeah, you kind of know what a good picture is, isn't it? When I was looking for an image for my book on protest, I was determined not to use. <laughs> so that was my image there. You know, um, Transnational protests in the media, you know, young people, ideas, out on the streets together. And you're going to tell me that's not such a good photo, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a good photo. You know, I thought it was had his own drama and so on. There's a politics in the image, for sure. Yeah. Uh, there was a question all the way in the back. Um, uh, how much of you agree that um, social media and new technology has made an enormous contribution to journalism? And as one of your um, lectures stated, journalism has been brought closer to us. And this is tantamount in uh, the way um, some of the disturbances in Arab Springs were reported and brought to us. My question is about control and regulation, as opposed to traditional media, where there's um, proper regulation. Where do you see social media going in terms of regulation? Do you think it should be very hard in terms of regulation? And would that be good? for us and democracy? In, in terms of regulation? Regulation, yeah. As opposed to traditional media. Um, where, where, where do you draw the line in terms of regulation? Um, that's a, I wouldn't want to draw the line, I don't, I don't think. Where, where, do where, where do you see them going? Where do you see going? I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it made, uh, it's made, it's made, it's made enormous positive contribution to journalism, we know that. Yeah. But then, as opposed to traditional media, there is um, there should be a line where regulation is concerned. So where is it going to spring out of hand? Where is it going to go? What's your view? Where do you see it going? Um, At the moment, we are enjoying the positive side because um, it's brought general closer to us, as one of your lectures has explained. But I'm comparing to traditional media where there's regulation. Well, you can report. I mean, do you, do you, can I ask you a question? Do you see a negative scenario yet to unfold then in the no, field no. of social media? I mean, I don't particularly. I mean, it's for sure that people will use whatever media tools they have, and that's not always a progressive thing, as we know. Uh, people like Eugene Barossov, in his book, uh, The Net Delusion, for example, is quite clear that you know, a celebratory view of the internet in relation to participatory politics is misconceived in the sense that it ignores the way in which state power will use and abuse the internet. Racists will use and abuse the internet and they will send out social media material that will be objectionable uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's not a, a happy garden necessarily uh, which is uh, just totally democratically oriented. Um, there will be anti-democratic forces and stuff like that. Tells us something about the nature of politics and society more widely, doesn't it? And the contention that is embedded within those social formations. And I think the media will, in some sense, be expressive of that, and also deployed by that type of balance of political force. But you know, the balance of force, I think, is, is, is changing. You know, the, the struggle for community of democracy I mean, and balance, I would say, is moving in the right direction. I don't see too many. Uh, Evil uh, monsters lurking on the horizon, but maybe well, tell me, do you see many? I, <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, I might be totally wrong. Thank you. Wish. Is it short? <laughs> yeah, just take. Um, I'm interested in your uh, concept of the. I'm oh, sorry. The um, the non-love, the non-love love that one. Yes, that one. Terrible. Um, not the non-love. 
and embeddedness. Um, because the way in which you describe it in, uh, in the context of Egypt and the fact that it can work in uh, humanitarian situations or other forms of conflict, you seem to be implying that it, it had a, a positive element to it. Whereas if you look at what happened with reporters on the street in the UK, it didn't necessarily, the fact that they felt involved and they were able to interact with people in ways that they would normally have run that system behind their desk and other things. So basically, that didn't inherently have a, that didn't inherently lead to anything. So I'm just interested to find out more about your. No, I, I think that's a good point. I, I think, and of course, this doesn't always happen, does it? Because uh, even correspondents and foreign journalists, we know from a number of studies, um, do not have complete autonomy, although some of them have more autonomy than, than their colleagues. But nevertheless, they're, they're part of a news machine and a part of an editorial process, and they don't always have complete control over what happens, so either in terms of their words or images. And many of them are, I know, going to be highly critical about what subsequently happens to their packages when they send them back uh, to, to British newsrooms, for, for example. Um, so, let's not, you know, we can't be idealistic about this. But nevertheless, I would argue, I think, on the basis of some of the interviews I've just done recently with uh, correspondents who became embedded uh, in disaster situations. And it, it wasn't just that they kind of flew in and they were there for a couple of days and then flew out again, so-called parachute journeys. And they were actually there for some considerable time. They did get to know people there. They understood through that familiarity uh, the, the context and the situation in which they found themselves. Um, and many of them, perhaps, who are benevolently disposed anyway, I mean, with a humanitarian ethic, became increasingly involved, involved and emotionally upset by those types of situations. And many of them give expressions of that now in terms of um, their follow-up kind of reflective pieces in terms of blogs and uh, uh, memoirs and, and so on and so forth. So I think part, it's partly to do with the actual empirical context that they find themselves in and the extent to which they, they are enabled experientially to really kind of soak that up and to understand it and to feel it. Uh, and if a, a reporter goes out on the night to a reporter riot, as I said earlier, and he or she is not really part of that community, they don't really understand who these people on the streets are and possibly see them as threatening, as you might, uh, they're unlikely to respond in the way that I was suggesting it could happen in a humanitarian or a disaster context. Okay, thank you very much. I saw a number of more fingers, but unfortunately our time is up. Uh, and I would like to invite you all to the floor of the building opposite the old building uh, for some breaks. Uh, maybe ask a question. Thank you very much. Thank you.